What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 213 at block height 623,377,000 on Saturday, March 28th. So, what's going on, Rick and Janine? Oh, nothing, man. Just two weeks into a quarantine, three weeks into the carnivore diet. Still trying to figure out if we're in the great TP crisis of 2020 or the great plague of 2020. We're somewhere in there. We're still debating the information, but. Doing pretty good. How about you, Janine? How's your day going? Uh, well, yep. Fourth week of isolation. Golly, you're four weeks in. I'm two weeks. I'm already thinking like, man, two weeks was nothing. Like the whole country here really just went into shelter in place to where here in Colorado, we're not supposed to leave our townships or our counties. Some areas of the country, like you're not supposed to leave your state. People are still doing it. But uh, you guys have been taking the move early on. You are four weeks, four four weeks in. I'm I'm looking at that like that's. I'm definitely gonna be sitting here for another two weeks. So you hang in tight though. Four four weeks in, huh? Yeah, I mean things like there's a lot more. Well, the funny. Th- I mean, I don't know why they think this is a good idea, but apparently cops around here like to drive around in packs of four which I find hilarious because if they did find anyone to arrest, uh, they wouldn't f- be able to fit them in the car because all the seats are taken by cops. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of cops driving around, but um, I have noticed like it's not on total lockdown here. There are kids playing outside, um, especially because the weather's getting better. I can constantly hear kids playing outside every day. Um, so other than that, I mean... Where I am, things are still pretty normal. Yeah, normal. I'd say that's one of the hair quote. Yeah, right. I know it's like the new normal. It's like I'd say it's normal amount of traffic on the trails, but it was like yesterday or a couple of days ago. I saw somebody walking down the trail in like a one piece bathing suit doing hula hoops, like they were part of a carnival or something. It's like okay, yeah, things are a little bit crazier out there. But uh, for the most part, people are still just on the trails. And I mean, like, there's all these strong languages about where we're supposed to stay. But people are just going about their business for the most part. Everybody's just really precautious. Oh, and um, I also, you know, because we're, we're, we're all about, us Americans are all about being at the top of the leaderboard and being the best and being the greatest. I just want to congratulate, you know, the orange man on the fact that he is now at the top of the leaderboard. Um, in terms of being the leader of the country with the most uh, confirmed cases in terms of testing positive. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting. We're number one. Yeah. Hillary Clinton learned how to friggin' Twitter troll. Like, I uh, saw that. She, twi- she trolled him on Twitter saying, he said, we're number one. Here we are. We're number one. Yeah, Mr. Trump. Yeah, we're one. People are dying and getting sick and shit. That's the thing a mature you know, responsible adult rubs in people's faces. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, look, I'm, I don't want to get into politics too much, but that's where the source of that came from. <laughs> like, yeah, we are number one, though, because, yeah, we need to ramp up the testing. And this is where really, like I was saying in the beginning of this, we don't really know where we stand because of the fact that all this is so cloudy and we're still trying to figure out if Wuhan is even clear, like where this originally came out of, like uh, we still don't really know the full story out of what's going on there. We don't really know the full story about what's going on in China. We're following Italy very well where the stories are pretty horrific. And uh, supposedly there's some areas of the country that are going to match or be worse than that. And we're really not going to know until that actually happens. So it is like because of the two week incubation period and because of the four to eight days it takes to for this to really put somebody down and out. I mean, yeah, we're we're kind of in the middle of this still. Well, and I also find it 
I find it absolutely disgusting that, well, I found it hilarious when a lot of the social media companies were like, oh, we're going to start clamping down on fake news. And if you're spreading misinformation that differs from, you know, the authoritative accounts like the WHO and governments and blah, 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 if you differ from them, you're, you're, you know, you're spreading misinformation. But I like, I realized like three weeks ago, I was like, if you actually look at what they're saying, they're contradicting each other. Like some of them are saying, stay 1.5 meters away, stay 3.5 meters away, stay six meters away. And then you have the who, who are saying, don't wear a mask. They're not really effective. They actually increase your chances of getting infected. And now because they're actually realizing that, you know, they fucked up in terms of getting, you know, critical healthcare workers, uh, t- you know, access to some stockpile that they never built because they're idiots. Uh, they've spent the last, you know, a couple of months telling people don't don't buy masks. They're not effective. It turns out they are. They just wanted to, you know, try to amend their fuck up of not stockpiling masks by giving out misinformation themselves. It's like, congratulations, you people are great. That's just like the scariest stuff to me is where people start, like you you hear that narrative, like that was one of the red alarms in my head. Like whenever you hear somebody spouting like just reverse logic to you, like, hey, don't wear the mask because, you know, you're not symptomatic, but you could be asymptomatic for two weeks. But don't wear the mask. It's that's so stupid. It's like, yeah, I don't have the symptoms, but I could have the symptoms tomorrow, and I could still be, I could still have this thing. I'm, I'm asymptomatic, so I'm gonna wear the mask to try and prevent. Like, that's is where, like, if you're somebody with a non-aggressive principle and you believe in that, in this, in this, you kind of are forced to wear the mask because you don't want to infect someone else. And I mean, like, uh, you know, I don't want that around i don't want that kind of burden on me you know there's something where somebody gets sick and it's a possibility i infected them like um and like yeah it's just too early to tell we're su- we're in these un- unclear waters we don't really know the- all these competing narratives about what's the safe distance what's the safe thing to do basically it's all just going down to logic and just protect yourself and yeah i know a lot of the uh, bitcoiners out there are arguing about what's the right move to do here because it's obvious that they're going to try and take advantage of this situation like politicians take advantage of every situation and move forward with some pretty orwellian shit but uh i think if we do the right move and do the smart thing and self-regulate like a market should then everything will be okay and be fine if we don't and we take a bunch of half measures and this thing keeps bleeding on for a long period of time then we could see a really strong clamp down which i do not want to see yeah and that goes both ways like with what good a mask actually does it protects you as well as others so like in both ways the world health organization was lying and actively misleading people telling them that something that could both protect other people from you if you're sick and protect you from getting sick they have been consistently telling people don't do that It doesn't work. Like, we are in the fucking twilight zone. Yeah, and they're also, they also, they're trying to like backtrack and justify it. I mean, I don't know if they have directly backtracked, but people who were spreading that advice are like, well, the reason they're saying that is because, you know, the mask is only like 70% effective. It's like, but 70 is better than zero. (laughs) Like, you people are so dumb. Uh, But I have to obviously give uh the like uh, out of all this happening like you know you have these people in great positions of power giving out misinformation but i have to give the award for most disgusting behavior to unfortunately a former uh co-host who we have since uh split from very deeply who thinks it's a good idea to take wagers on how many people are going to die or the quality of the health of the people who are going to die and i just want to say fuck off yeah there's some there's some everybody's kind of just this is where i was saying this uh last week and i think this is the truth is everybody's kind of dealing with this underpinned stress of like dealing with mortality and your own mortality and your own life and death and people don't really know what to do with that and like there's this stress level where a lot of people are just kind of doing everything they can to kind of either ignore that or just to make fun of it. Or, you know, I've seen terrible things with people like, just like, oh, there's nothing to worry about. And they go lick a bunch of toilet seats in the ground and people are doing stupid, stupid, stupid things. And this is where like it is, 
it is one of these things where, you know, markets learn in really powerful ways. And like this is there might be a bunch of Darwin Awards being dished out. I hope that's not the case. I hope that we can get this thing under control. But for sure, there's a lot of people out there behaving like this is nothing to worry about whenever if you look at everything like, yeah, you could say like a virus that doesn't have a particular uh, vaccine at the moment in time. It's, it's like it eventually will work its way through. But just with the information in different countries and geopolitics and the way that this is coming out, you kind of have to look at it at least like let's just sit still for two to four weeks and and see what's going on here because uh, we're not getting a clear picture until we actually see the deaths in front of us. So, uh, yeah, we're still kind of waiting to see that. Yeah. And I just want to say regarding JW, gambling on how many people are going to die in a situation like this just to try to set yourself up and look like a, a fucking authority figure or an expert, you are a fucking sociopathic piece of shit. All right. So this has just... been a very long intro. Yeah, I mean, like, it's a long intro, and, like, we got a, you know, it's like, this is a long little grouping of stories that just, like, continues into the same vein, like, uh, so it looks like the U.S. government has passed some measures. There was a lot of conflict about whether this was actually going to pass, so the U.S. passed the CARES Act. You got something to tell us about this, you know? I mean, I haven't really had a chance to look into it too deeply, aside from just kind of the general structure of what's going on, and really... On the high view, um, let's kind of look at, well, I mean, there's really a, a three, three main things. Where is all the money actually going? Um, what are the complications of actually getting it there? And then, you know, what other kind of shit has been pulled off? Um, the, I think it's the JFK Center. Um, Nancy Pelosi specifically got $25 million of funding um, for them to, to get uh, employees through all of this um, with all the insane shit she tried to jam in the bill. And after this is passed and that funding is confirmed, all of the people that that money was raised for got laid off anyway. So even the little things that the, the politicians were specifically trying to get in for favor trading, instant bullshit. But in terms of the actual distribution of money on a high level, it looks like it's actually being pretty widely dispersed between state budgets, um, overall federal health budgets, large corporations, individual people, um, and care packages, and loan programs for small businesses. But the kind of issues that I really see there are just the, the scalability concerns of actually getting money out to people. Um, for instance, the Small Business Association or the, the organization in charge of actually distributing small business loans in programs like this, um, I forget, it's only one order of magnitude and it doesn't really make much of a difference, but there's only either 500 or 5,000 people in total working for that organization now just sit and think for a minute how many small businesses there are all across this country and even at five thousand people think about how long it will take those people to get through the massive wave of loan applications by small businesses like just think about how long that will actually take for all of those businesses to have their application vetted, analyzed, and money distributed or not. That's not going to happen overnight. Like, think about the, the money going to individuals. I mean, I need to, I don't even really care from a personal point of view. I'm in a decent position and well prepared for this, but I haven't had, I haven't had taxable income that I filed for because my income thresholds are so low in years. I don't even know in my case how they're going to go about calculating that or how to look at that. I still have to dig deeper into that. People who don't have direct deposit set up, like a check mailed to you, that's going to take a while. Like how many people are there in this country whose addresses aren't up to date, who don't have 
a, a thing on file somewhere because their living situation is so bad. They're just moving around quick enough and not keeping up with letting Big Brother know where they are. Like there are going to be all kinds of, of impediments and roadblocks to getting this done quickly, all kinds of gaps that people just fall through. Like th this is not just, oh, the bill passed. Great. Like uh, th there's going to be a lot of issues actually implementing this. And I think that's something that people should just keep in mind. Yeah. I mean, like initially, I think one of the first things I saw was like, oh, you know, all these hotels are qualifying as small businesses and uh, they're being getting, given a large portion of this. I think a lot of that had to do with just mainly how are you going to compensate these hotels for the Army Corps of Engineers just taking them over and using them as surge hospitals? And how are you going to compensate them for that? But at the same time, it was like, yeah, uh, you know, Brooke Mallers runs a uh, small business here locally, and uh, they didn't qualify because of cannabis. You know, cannabis is completely like, you know, you try to put cannabis in this. There's like, do you, all of the cannabis dispensaries here locally are small businesses. I mean, there's like one or two that are connected to a conglomeration that could maybe be considered like big enough to where maybe, but, but I doubt they even get it because of cannabis. Like that's where it's like, you know, there's all these stupid little hangups in licensing that is going to definitely, you know, get a lot of people by the wayside. Like you're saying, as far as direct deposit, and how long does it take to get checks out? I've already seen something about apps on Twitter where they're like, they're going to pay you a hundred dollars if you test out this new beta software that'll uh, ping people beside you about whether or not they've been infected or not and uh, then send you back the results. But you get paid $100 every day as that goes on. Or, or you know, $100 every week or something. And it's just like, yeah, there's going to be all these weird things coming out now. And uh, like even me, I was get, I've been getting a ton of spam in my email inbox for uh, veterans programs where it's like, hey, this veterans program, you know, get 50% off this veterans program. You can get your groceries delivered. And I'm like looking through it and it's like, oh, it's all still stuff where I'm paying for things. But it's like w they're all I think you were saying it in a, in a side channel discussion about like I'm, they're all feeling the pain already. And they're already just like reaching out, trying to grab as much money as they can because they know like this isn't really for them. And this is going to go other places and like actually hitting the economic activity with uh, within the U U.S. economy. Like uh, that's where there's going to be some more market realities and, you know, some more of these cascading selling events like uh, it's coming. What do you, yeah. Like what do you think like the, the organization actually handling loan applications under this program is going to prioritize the small business that's just two or three people or the one that employs like 50 people? Who, who do you think they're going to look at and try and get money out to first? Like there's a reality on the ground moving forward with things like this. And it's not just going to be snap. Everybody gets their check and everything's all good now. Yeah. I mean, that's where we were saying like, uh, you know, there's all these different avenues. Uh, you know, we were talking about this one before the show. Uh, you want to take us into it? There's possibility. I mean, like, uh, you know, Square, they got their FDIC license. Hey. Maybe yeah. that's an easy on board. Yeah, Jack was, uh, you know, he actually directly tweeted that. Um, he quote tweeted somebody, or hold on a second, I screwed up my Zoom level on my browser. Sorry, guys. Um, but oh, yeah, good. he quote tweeted somebody who was suggesting use Cash App to, to get people the, the $1,200. And Jack quote tweeted that like, yeah, people need this help now. And companies like Cash App or PayPal or Venmo have the technology to get it to people, even if they don't have a bank account. And he's saying like, let us help. And I totally appreciate the sentiment here, but there's another side to that. That's not just like, oh, everybody gets cash app and sweet. They have to follow AML laws. They have to follow KYC laws. And all the people who would best benefit from that, think about how the risk analysis division in an organization like this is going to look at them, how they're going to have to look at them because of the law, what they're going to have to just randomly do when their fucking AML KYC systems go red flag to, to those people. Your money's frozen. We have to look into this. And just in, in the normal course of, of regular life, 
that kind of shit happens all the time and takes months, years sometimes to resolve itself. How much worse do you think that's going to be if 10 times the user base of these apps all flood on and they, they it's now, now we're in this situation. You have to apply these laws. So I think the idea of trying to move in this direction is incredibly dangerous for people if you do not carve out exemptions and fucking deregulate or, or just create a, a window of forget this for this, this window of time regarding KYC and AML laws, then this is dangerous because you are creating that fucked incentive situation where like, I think Jack actually just wants to help here. But I don't think he's thinking through that reality. How many people are going to sign up to Cash App and get their money? And they're, they're not going to be helped because the law requires you to freeze their account and stop their money from being used. Like if you, that problem needs to be addressed before this kind of shit starts happening. Automatic buy Bitcoin. I don't know. I mean, I, got, I, mean, I agree with you for sure. There's not just like, hey push this stuff out and it's going to solve all the problems. It is an easier avenue as far as barrier to entry to sign up for a cash app than a bank account. But yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking a lot of people, I know they're just thinking about using it to buy something like, well, not a, a lot of people I know because I would hang out with a lot of Bitcoiners that are thinking about like how exactly can they buy this next dip and you know, yeah, cash app 1200 bucks would be a nice place to just like sort of settle that. But that's not going to be for everybody. The point I'm trying to make is that the type of people he's talking about here are the people without banks, without a lot of money, without like the, the exact people whose stupid algorithms go high risk. You have to freeze this account. Those are the type of people he's talking about. And like, like the, do you not see the problem here in, in not trying to address the laws that force them? to treat their customers like that before you try to just bring a fuck ton of customers like that onto the platform. Like that's a recipe for disaster. And it's not because of anything like Jack or Cash App would want to do. It's because of something they have to do because of the laws and regulations. I mean, maybe you want to break that down just a little bit to say like, okay, if they just shut out and these people are of like not credit worthiness for this, like, uh, you know, and they start I mean, freezing like, everybody's accounts. Where does that the, go? Like, look at PayPal. Like, the a, a merchant whose account gets shut down for no reason. I'm sorry, you you were flagged as suspicious. That doesn't get resolved for a year. That's because the stupid algorithms they use to go through and make sure they're doing what the law requires them to do. Like, that's how that plays out in reality. You try to onboard a bunch of people without bank accounts, without hit, like that's all the type of people who fit the, you are suspicious. Now we have to come down on you with all these KYC and AML enforcement shit. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, this is like the time for red tape to disappear. Like we're seeing a lot of stuff where like people are delivering alcohol, people are doing drive through cannabis sales, like some red tapes are getting cut left and right. And I mean... I do see the Cash App doing a whole lot of sweepstakes. They used to do those sweepstakes every Friday. They do them every day now. They're just passing out money. And since they got that FDIC license, and I'm just thinking about like what, now that you got an FDIC license, you can loan out as much money as you want with 0% reserves. So, I mean, like, really, it's just like, where's the accountability in any of that? And like, why? I mean, like, if they're just trying to get the money out, like, I can understand. It's like, that's the way things have always been, and that's the way things are most likely going to continue. But I mean, you know, maybe it's uh, extreme measures. Let me put it this way. If you bring 10,000 people on the cash app and fix things for them and like 5% of them get everything frozen because they fit the suspicious profile and now we got to crawl up your ass because AML and KYC, like did, did you help those people or did you actively hurt them? And it's like not, you, you know, like I'm saying, it's not anything like I think Jack or anybody at Cash App would want to do, but that's how these laws work. A lot of these companies don't want to do any of this shit. They have to, because if they don't, the government comes around and fucks them. Well, this is where it's like, 
ultimately, man, I mean, yeah, just, uh, yeah, I mean, it sucks, but I mean, we live in a world where there is no such thing as privacy anymore and like the right to financial privacy. And yeah, I mean, I felt bad about just like a, a guy coming to my meetup where he's like, you know, in a bad situation is telling him where to go to buy Bitcoin. And it's like everywhere you go, you're going to be put in a place where you're going to have to dox yourself. And it's just uh, it's not a, a good situation right now. And I think we need to really work on that. Mm hmm. It's time for a new exchange infrastructure. I'm not going to say more, but, but that's basically the gist of it. Yep. But, uh, Rick, you want to kind of take us into the next one, though? I just kind of wanted to like get into right. something I was kind of worried about if Cash App and PayPal and everything actually get kind of drafted for this shit. Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to see how things go because it is a day-by-day -day thing. And yeah, I mean... In the days of this CARES Act, like we were saying earlier, we didn't really know if it was going to pass or fail because there was so much coming out of the media about it before anybody was even really in the halls to vote on it that uh, it looked like it was going to be, maybe it wasn't actually going to get passed. So, uh, but it did get passed, but it didn't have this legislation piece into it. But there was a lot of talk over the weekend or over the past week about a digital dollar. And U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown fought very hard behind the scenes to include the U.S. digital dollar into the CARES Act. And he's supposedly going to continue that fight, even through, uh, you know, even though the CARES Act got passed, he's going to keep pushing for this digital dollar. It's a Banking for All Act, which uh, would, quote, require member banks to maintain pass-through digital dollar wallets for certain persons and for other purposes, close quote. And it would have the language, uh, the language includes digital dollar, digital dollar wallet, which uh, this article compares to Libra coin and Calibra wallet, saying that this legislation kind of matches up with what Facebook is trying to accomplish. And, you know, this is from the Ohio senator, and uh, I think Pete Buttigieg was from Ohio, and, uh, you know, Zuckerberg liked him a lot, and Facebook has a newly constructed data center over there in New Albany, o Ohio. It's uh, just opened up this past February. Over $100 billion invested in the local economy with 150 full-time jobs. And, uh, yeah, so it looks like they're just going to keep pushing this uh, digital dollar legislation for Facebook and try to keep moving that forward as much as they can. I'm more of the thought process. We are a good ways out from actually seeing a digital dollar or a central bank digital currency. You might hear CBDC. Like, uh, you know, I agree with quite a few of the mumble constituents that will most likely see the government take half measures until they decide to take some full extreme measure like crypto. But, I mean, until the meantime, we could see a return to the gold standard. But for now, I mean, it's just uh, <laughs> it's just trillion-dollar repos overnight and, uh, you know, bailouts every day. The printer is just going crazy right now. So no digital dollar for now, but it was a lot of talk about it. And we're probably going to hear more about it in the future, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, economically, I think everybody is going to flood into the dollar and gold and Bitcoin. And the big question is just how well to the dollar and gold hold up on all angles when people just start rushing into those things. But, you know, I, I've been thinking for like a weeks now, like watch this be the thing that actually makes Libra happen. Oh yeah, that, that would be terrible. They'd be like, well, this is the easiest way. It's not the cash app. Because of FDI, yeah. you know, because of that, or any kind of problem there, it's like, it's just a lot easier. We'll just authorize this, you know, total control surveillance program of like, you know, the at Facebook can just shut down your wallet because, you know, you did something they don't like. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. what I would I want to do if I was a power hungry tyrant right now. This is where it is like, yeah, we're, yeah, we got to keep our eye on everywhere because. I mean, right now, the jurisdictions of the states have really taken over. I mean, like, basically, your governor is now your president, and the president is just a negotiator trying to get everybody to work together. So, uh, you know, if you're in Ohio, you, know, you might want to start lobbying against this sort of thing and being like, hey, maybe we need some Bitcoin meetups around here. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, that's about it with the legislation. And uh, that takes us into, well, I guess like there is some other things going on, uh, you know, that's pretty Orwellian and all this. Janine, you want to take us into the possibility of some emergency, some more emergency powers? 
Yeah, I'm sure uh, there's a certain speech from V for Vendetta which would fit perfectly here. Uh, we can maybe read it at the end, but basically uh, there was an article in Politico published on March 21st titled DOJ Seeks New Emergency Powers Amid Coronavirus Pandemic. And I'm just going to read from it because it's some pretty alarming shit. So the Justice Department quietly asked Congress for the ability to ask chief judges to detain people indefinitely without trial during emergencies, part of a push for new powers that comes as the novel coronavirus spreads throughout the United States. Documents reviewed by Politico detail the department's request to lawmakers on a host of topics, including the statute of limitations, asylum, and the way court hearings are conducted. Politico also reviewed and previously reported on documents seeking the authority to extend deadlines on merger reviews and prosecutions. In one of the documents, the department proposed that Congress grant the attorney general power to ask the chief judge of any district court to pause court proceedings, quote, whenever the district court is fully or partially closed by virtue of any natural disaster, civil disobedience, or other emergency situation. The proposal would also grant those top judges broad authority to pause court proceedings during emergencies. It would apply to any statutes or rules of procedure otherwise affecting pre-arrest, post-arrest, pre-trial, trial and post-trial procedures in criminal and juvenile proceedings Qu note the juvenile proceedings part so this applies to children and all civil process and proceedings according to draft legislative language the department shared with congress in making the case for the change the doj wrote that individual judges can currently pause proceedings during emergencies but that their proposal would make sure that all judges in any particular district could handle, handle emergencies in a consistent manner. Another controversial request, the department is looking to change the federal rules of criminal procedure in some cases to expand the use of video conference hearings and to let some of those hearings happen without defendant's consent, according to the draft legislative text. Um, it says video, uh, video teleconferencing may be used to conduct uh, an appearance under this rule. Um, and then they crossed out the phrase, if the defendant consents, because normally, uh, previously, if they wanted to do video teleconferencing, uh, they would have to get the consent of the defendant because the defendant should have the right to be present at their own trial or be present at hearings and all of that. Um, of course, as we can see in the UK, that is not a widespread uh, right uh, that is certainly not respected. But in the U.S., at least, it was in the federal rule of criminal procedure, and they are trying to get rid of it. So that's great. Wow. And I just read a headline that Rhode Island police are hunting down New Yorkers who fled Manhattan. I mean, that's a real headline. I, I mean, this is getting... I mean, yeah, that's scary. Well, I guess... Remember that uh, one of the definitions of a, a state or a sovereign is uh, the one who defines the emergency. So if you have a state who can basically arrest and detain people indefinitely, as long as they're an emergency, then they will keep the emergency going as long as they feel this is necessary. This is pretty much just goodbye due process. The core foundation of claiming there is any kind of legitimacy to the judicial system in this country well they're definitely yeah i'm gonna suspend that it sounds like i mean did they say like is this uh yeah i guess this is all emergency powers in an emergency situation and when's the emergency end is still a big question mark yeah so well th that's the interesting part so they proposed that these emergency powers would take effect during any natural disaster civil disobedience or other emergency situation yeah i mean uh this is where like civil uh, civil disobedience um what's that mean yeah what does that mean that is a uh quite broad <laughs> That is a quite broad category. Why is civil disobedience considered an emergency situation that justifies indefinite detention? 
Well, I mean, this is where, like, when we started this thing off, like, if you look at what's going on in China right now, it is pretty bad. Like, I mean, there are towns going out to other towns to, like, police fighting police, cop cars getting overturned, like, not really quite sure what's going on over there. But, I mean, like, there is political unrest like crazy. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you throw away due process, Raw. Or, I mean, Rick, like, that is, that is a core part of what this country is founded on that 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 that's what makes this legitimate if you want to try and argue this is all legitimate so if you if you throw that away then what the fuck do we have anymore no i'm not saying that it's legitimate or that it's something that should stand i'm just saying that's what they're looking at uh, people in america are not going to just react the same way that people in china did this is where it's like markets should self-regulate. We need to be able to understand that if we don't, if we let these charlatans and idiots that run around, I mean, look, I'm trying not to freak out here, but it is like, look, I'm trying to do everything I can to make sure that I'm not infecting people around me and I'm not getting infected and we're going to quell this thing as quickly as possible. But it's like, yeah, there's a bunch of assholes out there and there's a bunch of idiots and there's people, you know, doing all this shit. And I mean, yeah, I mean, if people are dying every day and then people are facing that mortality and their friends and their family are dying and people are rioting in the streets, like, I can see why they think they need to take this measure. I'm not saying it's legitimate or it should stand. I'm just saying, like, from a, from a perspective of, like, uh, oh, shit, the masses are about to eat us or kill us. Like, because, I mean, this whole legislation that they passed as far as, like, just the $2.2 trillion, everybody in there, like, didn't even really want to vote on it because of the fact that they knew that this is, like, really fucking over all the American people. And eventually that will come out. And, I mean, yeah, it's really hard to say, like, okay, well, I'm just trying to do the right thing here. Like, the market should self-regulate, but they're not. And they're like, you know, they're like, hey, well, we need to clamp down on it. That's what they're fucking doing. I mean, this is like, I, I get it. I mean, you're talking to somebody that served at the front line of Katrina where some really terrible shit happened. And, yeah, like, uh, whenever the world is in a level of chaos like uh, like that, I mean, you know, bad things happen, man. I'm not saying I, I agree with it or that it should stand or that it's legitimate or that it's that it's right. I'm not saying any of that stuff. I'm just saying the reality. Yeah, I'm just trying to say, like, let me put it this way. I see. I saw a meme the other day. That stupid, um, the kids movie The Rock was in, where he like spins around like <gasps> in the car, and it's like, hey, how bad could this be? Full on anarchists are trying to convince people to do what the government says. <gasps> and when I showed that to somebody, their response was, "Yeah, I tell people not to murder each other all the time." I'm such a statist cuck. Like you see the, the kind of point there? Like people need to disentangle something that's said from who says it. Because there are some things that governments say that make sense and are a good thing to say. You know, like don't murder people. And and saying unless, don't murder unless, people is not someone... is not being a statist cuck. It is it is doing what is ethically right. But that's actually not what they say. They say, you're not allowed to murder people, but we are. They define the exception. And also, to address, you know, this is a reality that they helped create. Like, this situation where they pretend or actually feel the need to institute emergency powers is because they have already delayed testing and creating you know potential vaccines just testing in general they have already delayed that process so much because of how much bureaucracy there is so people will die because they have too much power you mean you're ignoring the entire point it doesn't matter if a government says something if it's a, a good thing to say something that's right or the right thing to do or correct isn't magically bad because a government says it. Oh, man. I feel like we're in for this, a real long haul of trying to figure out what to do here because, yeah, I mean, 
it is a situation that's all kind of been created from our own mishandling of economics and the way that we handle manufacturing and supply chains. And like, I mean, that is also a big part of this and all that has to unwind. And, uh, yeah, there's just a lot more of this to where I feel like everybody's trying to take stances and positions. Like we know the outcome and we still just don't. And I think that they have that same stance and they see themselves as the powerful and they don't want to lose power. And so that's, this is the sort of thing they do, which like, uh, that's where, yeah, if like you have a place like here in Colorado, we have this ridiculous, like everybody, you can't even like, they're telling me like, if you want to go outside and exercise and go for a jog, don't run across town, run in your neighborhood only. And I mean, they're not saying like, if you run outside your neighborhood, a drone's going to show up and then start arresting you without any of your rights to detain you. I mean, there's none of that. It's really just powerful language. And luckily, like I've did, I, I read a poll that said like nearly 80% of people in Colorado are taking this pandemic very seriously. And I watched a video that I'll share in my final thoughts that stopped shared with us in the mumble about like the spread of the disease and the contagions and the way that you can, if you do isolate early on and you do, uh, you know, slow things down drastically early on, you can actually halt this thing early on to where like these sort of, pro these sort of like, uh, drastic overreaches to try and over like stop this like systemic failure um might actually not happen in certain areas of the country but the way that this looks it looks like there's going to be definitely areas of the country that are not going to have their full con constituent like their full constitutional rights anymore yeah and it's like you know this is kind of the point is ultimately this is a result of people not taking the actions they can themselves to deal with this and just treating this as a joke or not seriously. But part and of that not, is just but, civilization. But the, just real quick is like, I'm not trying to say like, that's why the government is doing this. So good government. I'm just saying that's why the government's doing it. Like the more we step up and handle things, taking this seriously ourselves, the harder it's going to be for a government somewhere to sell people on, yeah, bend over. Who needs their fucking due process right now? Yeah, get rid of this right, because be afraid. The, the more we handle this shit ourselves, the harder it is to sell that narrative. Oh, that's true. That's where it's like, I mean, honestly, like, I'm, I couldn't be happier, like, in this situation than running a Bitcoin meetup. I mean, like, this is where, like, ultimately, uh, like, yeah, I mean, hopefully, like, with the local on the ground leadership and, like, re rethinking supply chains. But I mean, like, I was trying to say earlier, it's like, this is a, this isn't really even a fault of the people in those cities. This is just, like, population densities and the way that this thing has an R non like of like infecting like going crazy in real population dense areas. There's so many of these like victims of circumstance with the supply chains and the population densities that like it, it really is a nightmare for uh, I feel really bad for people that are in areas like, you know, yeah, like New York or New Orleans or San Francisco or Seattle or like and there's a ton of those places, Chicago, Houston, freaking Atlanta, like all of them, man, they're everywhere. And like those places are going to run into big problems. And like, uh, yeah, I, hopefully, uh, you know, there's other people out there in the country like us. I know there are. And uh, they'll be, you know, talking about things like uh, like Bitcoin and things like, uh, you know, robust infrastructures and trying to rebuild like, you know, farm to table systems. And I mean, because, yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, everybody's, you know, this this great TP crisis of 2020 is right. And we're just freaking out over nothing. And everything will be okay. I don't think that's the case, though. Hopefully, on the other side of that, we'll re reformat things in a, in a better way for uh, sovereignty. Mm -hmm. It's a nightmare, guys. Yeah, and I mean, there's more angles of it. I mean, Janine, if you kind of want to push into some of the stuff going on with contact uh, tracing programs. Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion over the last couple of weeks about whether privacy violations in order to surveil and track people to predict or determine the direction and extension of the spread of the virus is justified. And there was a paper published on March 25th titled Contract Tracing Mobile Apps for COVID-19 Privacy Considerations and Related Trade-Offs. And I think I don't recognize the researchers, but it's someone from UPenn 
and I think, uh, I can't remember the other one, but it's mostly U.S. universities. And so it begins, contact tracing is an essential tool for public health officials and local communities to fight the spread of novel diseases such as for COVID-19 pandemic. The Singaporean government just released a model phone app, Trace Together, that is designed to assist health officials in tracking down ex- exposures after infected and infected individuals identified. However, there are important privacy implications of the existence of such tracking apps. And then part of the paper, uh, quote, discusses potential approaches to build upon the Trace Together model to obtain a contact tracing system with differing privacy char- characteristics for the users. Um, they then, you know, suggest various ways that these apps could be, quote, improved with, you know, anonymized tokens and proxy servers and blah, blah, blah. But the idea that you can actually do effective contact tracing in a way that governments appear to want to do while maintaining privacy in any meaningful way seems to be pretty implausible um, because basically a lot of our technology is not like it's fundamentally not built to respect privacy at any level. Um, And so of course, uh, Sarah Jamie Lewis has been commenting on this issue. And last week she tweeted, there's no such thing as a robust privacy preserving contact tracing tool because social graphs and location graphs are impossible to anonymize. Anonymity is fundamentally about removing social and location context. Once you do all that, you're left with the otter system. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not bringing my phone outside anywhere I go during all of this, like, period. And like oh, yeah. on the other side of that, like, you know, I'm removing information that could actually deal with this. So what I've been doing is keeping a couple days in between any trips I make to somewhere so that I can have if I started developing symptoms some kind of rough certainty where that happened and if something happens i can go report that to who needs to hear that but you don't get to just real time track every fucking step i make with all of the the dance and the game you have to play to legitimize that in any context stripped away no well yeah so i'm i'm a bit curious because i've i i know a few people who have phones and it's been kind of funny to like hear about you know they're getting text messages they're getting these little like pop up like i don't know how to describe them but they're like little like banners on their phones that say like stay at home or stuff like that yeah so in the u.s it would be amber alerts um but also people who are not in the u.s are getting stuff like that and it's quite funny because a lot of like understandably a lot of people are like well that's really freaky like how how do they know that and well you know why are they interested in me and i'm gonna turn off my phone now but like this is the point that i've been trying to tell people for such a long time is that like you're you're freaking out because they're being obvious about the fact that they're watching you in this way but they were doing this before now mm-hmm. it's just now that now yep. they're telling you and they're sending you messages about the fact that they're doing this but they were still doing it before which is why i am hashtag phone free <laughs> yeah pretty like as far as my like if my understanding is correct, like those alert systems are literally baked into the phones and the cellular networks and protocols to go out like literally any active device. It'll just, oh, it's the special alert message. Receive that no matter what. Yeah. And the Jeep, like, cause you know, a, you, you know, a while ago I was wondering, cause I was still stuck in like, oh, the GPS isn't that precise. They can only see the general neighborhood. But obviously, if it was that imprecise, you would have the problem of, you know, just people being at home and you would see these hot spots of lots of people in an area and you'd be like, oh, no, got to send them a message to separate because they're clustering. But of course, the GPS is, you know, precise enough that they can tell that you're in an apartment or you're in a home, you're not out on the street in a group. So, you know, it's gotten a lot better. They are able to tell that. So, 
you know, this, I keep telling people this is what they're doing. And now, now they're just being honest with you about the fact that they're doing it. And yeah, you should be freaked out. And then you should wonder, you know, what else are they doing with this information the past couple of years that you've been carrying around this tracking device in your pocket everywhere you go? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I've been with you guys. I've been doing the same thing. I've, I've left my place just few times uh to go grab a couple of things and run an errand and every time it was uh you know just leave the phone at home was the protocol but uh yeah i mean what's interesting here in colorado was like the governor actually like opened up onto this fact where he was like we're monitoring your gps data because uh we need to see the percentage of um of self-isolation that's going on like the self uh distancing whatever it is social distancing they want to measure the percentage of social distancing because they have it tied to a metric of like if the state if the state issues uh, these strict orders and seventy percent of people do the social distancing then they need you know only two thousand ICU beds by the end of April if fifty percent of people are taking this seriously and are taking social distancing seriously then they're going to need four thousand beds by the end of April. And uh, he said that we're taking your privacy seriously and we're not using this to really track any personal data. This is all just being used to commercial commercial data we're working with. So, I mean, like, you know, he was opening up about it. But for sure, I mean, like, I'm not taking that as 100 percent. Like, I imagine, you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on that he can't necessarily speak to. I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, you know, stuff going on that's development that's not necessarily tied to Colorado or the state and yeah, that sort of stuff is, uh, that's where I'm trying to avoid this thing. But I wouldn't be surprised if, like, yeah, not too long from now, they're like, hey, you know, if you go somewhere, you better carry your phone. Well, and so one of the interesting related things is, you know, there was that talk about, you know, Google is going to be creating a website uh, for the government that helps people find, you know, testing zones that turned out to be bunk. It's like they haven't even released it to the Bay Area yet, as far as I know. Right. But when when people actually went and looked at the website and the privacy policy, uh, it, it's not Google, but it's a subsidiary of Alphabet, which Google is a subsidiary of Alphabet. Um, but this company who is supposedly developing this not actually great website, the privacy policy says that um, they're not only going to collect a lot of information about you, but they're going to be sharing that data with pharmaceutical companies and a whole bunch of other mm -hmm. things for commercial purposes. And they were going to keep it like, and this is what, this is what they were promoting as a way for people to find, you know, places to get tested. They want people to share their personal health information on this website that's going to share it with pharmaceutical companies that, you know, <laughs> I mean, we all know that they uh, have some very interesting uh, pricing, pricing mechanisms for a lot of products, especially in the U.S., like, why are we doing them favors right now? Why why does a website that is just supposed to give people directions to a testing zone have to have this shit privacy policy that is supposedly commercially valuable to pharmaceutical companies? Like don't expect don't ex not, none of these people take privacy seriously. They're cert they don't take it seriously now, and they weren't taking it seriously before because they built these... The, the fact that they didn't even have to ask you for permission to do this is because they built systems that are not serious about privacy. They have forced these systems to not be serious about privacy. They're not going to do it now. Yeah, but they'd say we all voluntarily bought the phone, right? Signed the contract. I'd say, yeah, that's just that's what they would say. <laughs> you, though. I mean, you're like a... You're a freaking rock star in this game point is though things are going to get very hairy and people should really be thinking through how to not just hand over all of their rights but at the same time not just make an actually serious situation a lot worse yeah it's hard to say where to go but i think the easiest thing is just leave the phone at home for now mm -hmm. oh but also keep in mind i don't know if every country or area is doing this but some of them like you can't just turn your phone off if you go somewhere that you think might trigger you know an alert or something 
because apparently they're also tracking when you turn your phone off. Yes, they can do that too. <laughs> Did you know that they were doing that wow. before? Yes, they were. Yeah. And they're the, doing it now. The cellular modem that actually connects to the cell network is effectively its own completely isolated computer with closed source binary blobs um, that your phone's computer talks to. Like, as far as I'm concerned, that aspect of the phone is something you just have no control over unless you literally pull the battery out or shield all like EM emissions from it. Mm -hmm. so they're basically they're going to be watching your usage patterns and if they see your phone go off like in the middle of the day when it normally isn't off then they're going to think that you're deliberately turning it off and there was i don't remember where he was he might have been spain or something but there's a guy who reported that his phone ran out of battery and within uh i think he said an hour i th might have even been less than that but he said like very quickly he had police knocking at his door asking like hey what's going on which you know wow. i don't i you know people say lots of things on twitter it might not be a true story but that seems entirely plausible to me in a system where the police have direct access to this kind of thing or at least are getting notified of these usage patterns and are being told go to this area go to this apartment and check things out because there's been some unusual activity yeah i wouldn't want to be in ohio near that facebook data center because they were talking about bringing in some foxconn guys and stuff Man, yeah this is where it's like i'm kind of glad i'm in colorado older like there's like there's there's discussion about actually trying to improve people's privacy trying to bring back privacy and you know trying to improve infrastructure for a while and there's already like this censored market that has a lot of economic daily activity that's already like on the hamstring to me it's like all these things are terrible but at the same time like you're saying a lot of people are going to get shaken the hell up and they're going to start looking for an answer to this problem and a lot of that's going to lead them towards bitcoin mm -hmm. if there's a silver lining well so besides bitcoin um i think it was matt I think it was Matt, Matt O'Dell, who published a video about um, graphene. Way, yeah, graphene OS and ways that you can get rid of, you know, if you, I mean, this applied only to Androids, but if you're an Android phone, you want to get rid of the Google shit, which, again, not going to completely eliminate the problems, but, you know, you'll eliminate the Google problems. And besides that, I mean, that's the most you can do in terms of, decontaminating your phone of surveillance where crap as much as possible but at the end of the day it's still a phone you should just not trust it mm -hmm. and, you know, I, there's... I, real quick Go i want to say about graphene um they only support like the the pixel phones and I actually think that's a, a good thing when it comes to these Android forks because it usually turns into just like a single developer or two pretty much being in charge of the repo for like one specific phone and the, the Android fork for that. And graphene kind of concentrating on just those few like phone models, you don't have to scatter the developer attention around so much and like keep as much attack space open. You know what I mean? Sorry, I was like looking it up. Yeah, because there's a, there's a, there's another uh, one out there called Lineage and like that. It's it's nice software, but it's like literally every specific model of phone has just like a, a, a dude or two who's doing all the work for that phone. And so it's not as many eyes on shit. You know what I mean? And I'm just curious. It was just like looking. Do you know where this project is based out of, Graphene? Um, not off the top of my head, no. There's also I'm the... Um, I, I don't... I can't... I, I think it might have been released, but I'm not sure. The Purism phone... Um, they when I last checked when all of this was starting to go down, uh, I looked whether their supply chain was disrupted, and it wasn't really clear whether it was because they said they supplied parts from the U.S. and parts of China, and I th can't remember where the other location was. Um, but they're based in San Francisco, and it's possible. 
Um, there are, they do allow you to pick up the phones from their office instead of having them delivered. So it's possible they have a supply there that you could buy from them if you got in contact, but I don't know. But that's also another option because they've actually custom built the hardware of the phone. Yeah. And I think they actually have like some of their stuff that's actually made mostly in the U.S., because I, I saw that last time I went on their site. They had yeah. like a U.S. model, but it was way more expensive. Well, I'm just thinking like, uh, you know, there's a lot of development going on for uh, privacy and liberty and sovereignty and freedom all around the world right now. And, you know, the United States has kind of been an empire for a while now. And we've always sort of speculated how much rights do we actually have and everything. And, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I just hope that, yeah, a lot of this development is going to continue on and people understand like, you know, yeah, like uh, Bitcoin is it's a global network and we're all in this together. And like, you know, if we find something that works somewhere, it's like, you know, we can try and export that to other places. And, you know, I'm just thinking about like it sucks for people that are living in certain areas of this country. And, um, you know, it's definitely going to be a rough road going about it. It'd probably be in a better spot somewhere else. But, yeah, I don't know. I'm still just trying. To, I'm still stuck on this like our freedoms and everything. All right. Just yeah. Let's uh, just don't be foolish. Um, I think Sal agorist made a tweet the other day. Um, it's a little, little kernel of truth in it. Um, while social, or social distancing is going on, don't congregate unless you have enough people to overthrow the government. <laughs> See, that's what they're afraid of, mm -hmm. but yeah. So yeah, let's move into some more of the technical stuff, huh? Yeah. Um, so next up is just kind of a specific example of a uh, publicly held mining company uh, an operation shutting down in California. Um, it's uh, Digital Farms, formerly known as Super Crypto Mining. It's held by uh, DPW Holdings. It's pr pretty much just a holding company that strategically invests in things they consider undervalued. But as of... Um, what was it? March. Hold on. Sorry. March 3rd, um, they filed and pretty much announced they were going to be shutting down uh, their entire mining operations due to the incredibly or unprecedented market conditions domestically and internationally. Um, they have just completely shut the entire mining operation down. And for kind of a context on what was going on in terms of efficiency and things, um, in April of 2019, they had taken out a $5 million loan from two um, private investors and bought a thousand Antminer S9s. So they are pretty much, if, if they have not been constantly cycling uh, through and upgrading equipment, which I don't think they have because they're a public uh, company, they actually have to file reports with the SEC. Um, they were pretty much running the least efficient hardware out there. And so they've, because of that, had to completely shut down due to the massive price drops and changes in mining profitability. And I think just kind of looking at this, the first specific example we can see is all the data I can dig through and find is these are inefficient old miners. Like these are operations that did not get the most efficient equipment they can, tried to hit the lowest profitable price point they could. They just were working with something viable in previous market conditions and a rapid change just smashed that. And another thing is, I kind of want to watch now over the next six months or so and see if they actually spin back up any kind of mining operations on the other side of the market when things start recovering. Like, is this just they're done now? They're giving up? Or is this just they're dealing with the operational costs and that reality and kind of shuttering things until they're in a profitable situation again? And I think that'll be kind of an interesting insight into this class of miners mentality about this ecosystem. Like, did they just impulsively jump into something because they thought it's guaranteed to go up from here? Or that are they actually a long term rational player who understands how this works? Yeah, I would imagine uh, if they're 
right around here, uh, they're probably, and they shut down, like you're saying, like with these inefficient miners, they're probably going to spin back up the minute that, I mean, like this was a recent story. So I'm just looking at like, we just had that 15% drop in difficulty. And that was something where everybody was like, oh, here comes, a, like you can expect a price drop. It's like people trying to say that price is going to follow hash, which, yeah, you know, it's the opposite of that. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin price is going to do whatever it wants. It's just hanging out around here, and uh, for sure, it's like, yeah, I think everybody here is mining is because they know, like, yeah, we're coming into a happening. Like, this is the time to be mining. Like, if uh, if you can, you're mining now, and, you know, if, uh, I mean, like, they need to get some more efficient machines, or they need to start mining shit coins or something with those, because, uh, I mean, the hash rate, I imagine, is going to keep going, well, I don't know. We'll see how it goes, you know. It's more rough, rough seas ahead. Well, I think the rational play for somebody in this position, they're a holding company. Like they, I mean, yeah, everything is kind of wrecked right now, but like they have a lot of things they can just balance the books across. So I want to see like, are they looking at Bitcoin as something to just kind of hold while it's in a shit spot right now across everything they're holding and bring that back online later or not? Or are they just going to dump this completely first? And like, you know what I mean? Like that will show kind of their attitude about having an investment uh, like that in this space. I see what you're saying. Like the sentiment, the investor sentiment with the market and, you know, somebody that's already had been like this exposed and invested in Bitcoin. Like, how are they going to play it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. I would like to, I mean, this is where it's like, we're in such the middle of this. It's almost like I know. We're in the middle of like a bull trap and everything like, uh, you know, everybody's like, hey, you know, we're getting these checks and everything's going to work out. But like we just talked about for an hour, it's not necessarily going to work out. There's going to be some more realities. We'll mm -hmm. see how things play out. Yeah. What's up next All week? Right. You trying yeah, to let's... snipe my bonus check for me. <laughs> yeah, man. I saw this like this wasn't on the desk and I was like, whoa, uh, let me see if I can get some uh, stack some sats of my own here. Say, uh, hey. Liquid and Blockstream, that's right, triggered people, it's happening. Um, they just uh, announced 10 new federators in their uh, Liquid sidechain. That's uh, AquaNow, DVChain, Merkle Pro, Hodel Hodel, Ledger, Listed Reserve, Point95 Global, Stoker, Wiry, and Wiz. Probably you guys might know Wiz is out there, he's on Twitter, everybody knows him. Now, uh, let me see here, I actually had some notes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I probably should add that out. So, like, yeah, Liquid now has a total of 45 member exchanges and financial institutions. And, uh, yeah, these federators serve in the Liquid governance and have the ability to peg in and out of that side chain with the developments that it provides. Hopefully, you know, that's some more privacy, some more speed, like, you know, just trying to help scale Bitcoin in general. And, uh, yeah, you know, we know Hodel Hodel, uh, there's... You know, that's a decentralized exchange. And so now they have LBTC as a possible payment option on their exchange. And uh, Stoker is a, uh, let's say, it has it listed as a smooth issuance of liquid based security tokens, such as upcoming EXO token securities platform. I was looking at it and it looked like a uh, fundraising platform. But uh, yeah, I guess it's also like just a, Securities platform, a lot of it looks like DEXs and everything, just like indexes of different assets. And uh, Wiz is uh, adding the LBTC to the uh, trading platform BISC. So BISC and HODL HODL will both be LBTC federators. And I'm sure that could help their liquidity situation over there. And that'll be a good thing for their books. And Ledger is going to bring liquid assets to their hardware wallet. And uh, yeah, I mean, just bringing more federators into the system and you know, just uh, building up that volume over there at Liquid. So things are moving forward. And, you know, I mean, right now they're touting that they have like a uh, more, you know, more public, uh, I guess, liquidity in dollar amount uh, than, li than Lightning right now. But I mean, you know, this isn't really a race. Like both of these things are good projects and both going to solve different problems. And yeah, it's just uh, good to see like that, you know, this, Liquid sidechain is continuing to march forward and it's got like uh, 45 members and, you know, some really reputable names in there and people that are trying to do some really good development. So, yeah, just, you know, some wins all around as far as uh, trying to help build up 
privacy and scale and you know new exchange infrastructure so yeah it's really good things uh coming out of blockstream still mm -hmm. as usual you know yeah i'm even getting a little surprised at how flexible and interesting liquid is getting with the whole trust model aspect of things because it's like i i thought it would be a very useful widely adopted thing just being corporations like balancing the game theory of the federation but like a random bitcoiner in japan is a liquid federator and federation member right now like i i think like i severely under or underestimated how interesting that's going to be and like as far as the the liquidity on liquid versus lightning i mean yeah it's it's not a pissing contest and also like we're not going to see all the liquidity in Lightning because people have private channels. So that, that's another thing to kind of think about there. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's definitely an interesting project. I mean, like, there's lots of interesting aspects to Lightning and Liquid that I think are both favorable for this, like, new exchange infrastructure we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on the other side of things, too, um, it's not the only new bit of news with Liquid. Mm -hmm. uh when was it uh, on march 26th they lowered the um minimum um fee rate to 0 0.1 satoshi per virtual byte and they also incre increased the range proof size and so for those of you who didn't know um the range proof for confidential transactions in liquid um didn't actually hide the entire amount of um like in that field it only um kind of hid certain digits in the whole satoshi field because the that proof gets bigger and bigger like the the more um like decimal spots in that number you obscure with the range proof and so like what they've done here is lowered like the floor fee rate you have to pay for the federators to confirm you and increased the the range proof size so it's covering like the whole range of um like decimal points in the amounts in a transaction so this is like they have kind of improved a shortcoming so to say in the privacy and offset that in how low of a fee people can pay so that it's not just everybody's paying more money for this now. And that's another kind of Damn. interesting thing with this being a federated system. If everybody running it agrees, they can just tweak knobs like this. And there's a real benefit in that. Quick consensus. Mm -hmm. Did we just have a kitty attack a computer and try to get a comment in, Jimmy? Oh, no. I was uh, I was just preparing to make the kaching noise. Uh, cash checked, Shinobi. Kaching. <laughs> <laughs> cash register sounds board noise there. All right. Uh, looks like we got some other cool tech. Dun dun dun. So Rodolfo is kicking ass again and making random cool things. Um, he. You don't say. <laughs> He pretty much, it looks like he took the PCP boards for an open dime and tweaked it um, to pretty much just have a very simple circuit and a full-size USB connector so that one side of the device clamps on to a 9-volt battery and you can plug a cold card into um, this, you know, rather than a wall outlet and, and all that. Um, and this is really fucking awesome. One, because like this is just super simple. Um, even a pretty non-technical person who wants to be really paranoid should be able to learn the things necessary to have a high degree of confidence that this is sending power and nothing else. And this is just awesome because I don't think people appreciate how fucking like big risks like that are like there are you know like i right now am a lazy asshole who doesn't like um you know laying wire and and getting that out of the way somewhere so i just have a little wall adapter in my power outlet that bridges to another one near my router 
and that's how I get Ethernet. Like there are things that you, it's plugged into a wall outlet, data can still move through there. Like people have like are starting to make crazy compact like malicious USB cables and shit that have like a full MCU ready to perform independent malicious operations without any part of the end casing of the cable being any bigger than like the actual non counterfeit cable would be like th those kind of, of things are insanely easy to hide if somebody wants to fuck with you and there's a little another gizmo from coin kite to deal with tinfoil hat attack vectors take my money yeah man cold cards and liquid and lightning and just like i mean bitcoin in general like this that's some cypherpunk stuff but i mean yeah i love these open dimes and just like this sort of ways that you can make it just really dumb it down to where there's no real chance of uh, vulnerability there novak's a freaking security genius over there great stuff mm -hmm. all righty and uh all right so this this is gonna be fucking cool so um tom trevithan from commerce block uh I, i've had them on uh you guys weren't able to make it but i did the special edition with him and um gregory uh on the stuff they're building over there have put together an idea for state chains without the need for l2 and this I think is just really fucking awesome because there should always be options and an option that doesn't require changing the Bitcoin protocol is always nice to have. So pretty much the gist of this is, um, first of all, they have to use, um, transactions with end lock time, um, because there's no L2 mechanism. And so what this does is like any state chain created with this would have like a ticking time until it has to close like the, the old, um, pre lightning network, um, payment channel designs. But in exchange for that, you would get, you know, the kind of flexibility where you can just trade it to anybody without having to go on chain accounting for that timer. And so you would have the initial time set where this is the first owner and the earliest that they can just unilaterally close the state chain. And then the person they transfer would deduct a certain value in time or blocks, whichever one they want to do, um, so that they can get theirs in first before the first owner and so on and so forth. And so like each time the state or state chain transacted, that clock that you have to close it by kind of ticks down. And this is kind of the, the limitation or trade-off you have to make without L2. And now the other part of it is tweaking the key structures um, to pretty much rely on ECDSA multi-party computation. And you would effectively have, you know, a similar, um, a key path that lets the current owner get their money back after the time lock transaction confirms. And then the one, um, where the, the state chain operator and in cooperation with the other person, um, could do this. And now I'm going to probably, um, just keep this very high level because I have only had like a day to sit through and think down the math, but pretty much, um, you can use um, a lot of the more complicated aspects of ECDSA that everybody is looking at Schnorr to do in a simpler way because it's just a pain to do a lot of the interactive stuff with ECDSA. To have the original owner and the state chain operator pretty much independently generate um, their own private keys. Um, do some multiplication between the public keys resulting in that and wind up having the same private key um, or shard of a private key um, without anybody actually having the full key. And during the transfer mechanism to like a new state chain owner, like the, the original one is passing it off to somebody else, 
there's kind of another interaction between this new person, the original owner and the state chain operator to kind of recreate um, this kind of dynamic where now the new owner and the state chain um, operator arrive at the different shard for the, the public key where they would do the multi-party uh, computation to sign for that path. And you pretty much rely on the state chain operator to delete um, their share of the key that they had in common with the original owner. And so you can kind of create the, the trust model here where as long as you are trusting the state chain operator to be honest and delete those keys, there is no way for previous owners to collaborate with the operator and cheat the current owner. Um, and there's actually a little bit of an improvement there, arguably, versus the, the design for this on L2 in that um, if you trust the state chain operator is deleting their key shard that goes with the previous owner, then even if that previous owner hacked the state chain operator, they don't have the, the key piece anymore necessary to like steal the state chain back from whoever owns it now. And so like, this is just a really awesome design and that, you know, there, there's kind of the big trade-off of like, once you create this, there's a ticking clock now and it has to close before that clock is done ticking. But it's still pretty awesome to see a design for something as flexible as a state chain that we could implement if we just don't get L2 for some reason. And, you know, it's a lot more restrictive, but you still have a, a payment channel construct that you can just freely transfer off chain and that's an awesome option to have yeah man i mean ruben's on top of this like this uh this is some high level stuff all right is it my turn yeah i was gonna Oops. say janine do you want to take this in <laughs> i'm sorry i just confused by uh my push to talk buttons again just real quick uh -huh. I just wanted to say, like, I feel like when Bitcoin stops changing and everybody gets sad that all the things they wanted to build that were counting on changes that didn't happen before then are just going to slowly get over it. And there will still be another crazy renaissance of like, but can we do it without that new thing? Oh, well, yeah. Everybody wants to try and make it their way. Not Ruben. Good job, Ben. This is looking looking awesome. I need to dig into it more. Like I was saying, it's a uh, it's high level stuff. Honestly, it was one of those that kind of like flew past me the first time I heard it, and like every other time, I'm kind of just like, all right, you got a lot of stuff in there. Can you fit that in there? I need to like sit down and really look over L two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Do you want to take us in the next one? Sorry about that, Jimmy. I I I I knew I was gonna do that at least one time again this episode. Mm hmm. So uh, yesterday was Ross Ulbricht's birthday. He would be, well, he is, he is 36 years old. Um, and he, via his mother uh, and support group, published a letter. Um, so I'm just going to read the first part because I think it's very, uh, it's very prescient to the current times. And so he said, today's my birthday, my seventh in prison, more than any other day of the year. I feel the weight of the time I have lost, the years of my life I will never get back. Time is priceless, yet it must be spent. It cannot be saved for later. These seven years are gone, spent in some of the, some of the many concrete and iron tombs that dot our countryside, spent struggling to make sense of fate and searching for meaning within the pain. How were your last seven years spent? Did you spend them in a way that reflects their scarcity and value, or were some of them wasted? How will you spend the next precious seven? Yeah, that's awful. I mean, like, uh, you know, 36 years old is still a young guy. I mean, hopefully, we can just, I mean, there's a lot of this stuff going around where maybe you can get him out somehow, pray to God, because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of those crap situations. But um, for sure, the past seven years have not been unproductive for in my case. And I'm definitely going to continue to be productive in these years. I mean, ahead, it's just uh, it's all about trying to build out this system that, uh, you know, this is where it's like, I hope he, you know, I know he know, I know he knows. Um, but uh, I hope, uh, you know, he's constantly reminded somehow about how much uh, influence that uh, that project put out onto the world. 
just think I like it sucks to say, but like I don't think there's anything getting them out of there at that point except the government collapsing or the president pardoning them. And well, I mean, you know, prison riot. Like, well, look, like we're saying, things are crazy. We've got some breaking news that have been breaking we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But, I mean, like, you know, I think he's in Colorado still. And, you know, we're talking about cannabis, just purchases with Bitcoin and, you know, new red tape and, you know, new jurisdictional powers. So maybe, you know, everything's on the table right now. Mm-hmm. But I guess there's another piece of news you want to tell us about? Oh, yeah. So this is... Um, let's just say, wow, I feel so bad for people in Canada right now. Cause, uh, anybody who traded on Quadriga, you have a very big chance of getting fucked right now. <laughs> if you didn't pay your taxes, uh, did you just the- say Canada. Yes, I did. And I did that intentionally. Um, Why? The-, the Canadian tax authority is demanding all customer records from Quad or from Ernst and Young in regards to Quadriga to ensure that all of the customers have been tax compliant. And part of Ernst and's response, they they're going to provide everything they have, um, is that they just don't have a lot of the specific records that the Canadian tax authority is asking for. So to me, that leads in, um, I want every single trade made by every single customer so that we can go find all the people who didn't pay taxes and crawl up their ass. And that is just so fucked <laughs> that that's going to happen now after everybody there pretty much just got completely financially wrecked. On top of that, if the records are there for you, um, the Canadian tax authority is going to start crawling up your ass. And so this is where exchange, old exchange infrastructure really sucks. This is where we really need to start building out some new stuff. I'm going to just keep saying that. Mm-hmm. And think about how many people, depending on how much and what data Ernst, and, Ernst Young is able to get a hold of, like it could be like your shit from years ago and, oh, I'm, I, I'm good. I got away with it. Nope. 2020. Knock, knock. Uh, some shit happened and we don't care that you lost a bunch of money. You didn't pay us money that you owed us. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm like uh, talking this other news. Mm-hmm. We can get to it. Janine, you want to tell us um, updates on uh, Assange? Uh, yeah, sir. So um, there was a bail hearing on, I think it was March 26th uh, for Assange in the UK. Um, basically, his lawyers wanted to make a bail application to get him at least a temporary release from prison in order to um, mitigate the risk of, you know, a coronavirus outbreak in prison because he has health conditions, including a chronic lung issue for uh, a long time now that could increase the risk of him not only catching it, but having um, more serious side effects than the average. So, um, there was one journalist, I think he was from the Australian, I'm not sure, I think he was an Australian journalist, but he was actually present at the hearing, there wasn't very many people, um, and so he ended up publishing an article about uh, what he saw there, and so he wrote, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has been denied bail after arguing that his release from a UK prison would mitigate his high risk of catching coronavirus. Um, they made an application in Westminster Magistrates Court on Wednesday with less than 15 people in attendance due to the coronavirus lockdown. Um, the irony here, of course, is they denied the bail application because uh, the judge said that there wasn't you know, grounds that uh, the prison wasn't protecting itself against coronavirus. And yet, hello, we have uh, social distancing happening in the bail hearing court itself. Duh. Um, anyway, District Judge Vanessa Baritzer uh, ruled that Assange had absconded before and said that Belmarsh Prison is following government guidelines to protect detainees with no confirmed virus cases there yet. Uh, actually, that is disputed because... Um, according to his 
lawyers uh, who contacted the prison. Um, I believe it was to just, you know, schedule uh, meetings and such. Uh, they were told by, they claim they were told by the prison that um, that might not be possible because a number of employees at the prison were at home sick. Now, does when they said at home sick or um, on leave, does that mean, you know, they were, they believe that they were infected at the prison? Or does that mean they just haven't come into work because they suspected that they were infected? Who knows? But either way, very suspicious. Um, continued, um, the judge accepted that government advice may change rapidly, but for the time being, she denied strict bail for the 48-year-old. Basically, the strict bail conditions were that he was going to be under house arrest again, and actually it was going to be more restrictive. He wouldn't even be allowed to leave the house itself, whereas before, when he was under house arrest, he was just required to stay on the property, but this time he would be restricted to the house. Um, and she said, as matters stand today, this global pandemic does not of itself yet provide grounds for Mr. Assange's release. In my view, there are substantial grounds to believe that if released today, he would not return to face his extradition hearing. There are no conditions to allay this concern, and this application is therefore refused. Um, defense lawyer Edward Fitzgerald QC wore a face mask, and his colleague Mark Summers attended via Zoom while the U.S. government lawyers dialed in. I also want to note, again, more irony here about her, well, not really irony, but just complete stupidity and blindness and lies about this not being a problem, is that Assange, one of Assange's own lawyers, uh, Balthasar Garzon, who is like a really famous lawyer in Spain, is, uh, I don't know if he's still there, but as of a few days ago, Balthasar was in a private clinic in Spain because he had respiratory failure from coronavirus. Like, his own lawyer is sick with this, and this stupid judge does not consider that, you know, <laughs> a sign that maybe this is a problem worth considering. Um, and also, by the way, she actually ignored the advice from, I can't remember, there's an organization in the UK that it's like, you know, the prison system bureaucracy stuff. And they were saying that, you know, it's going to be very likely coming up that at least a substantial portion, especially nonviolent offenders, might have to be released from prison because it just won't be safe. It won't be safe for them to be in close quarters um, like that. It won't be safe for prison employees to be there. They might have to you know, stay at home, which makes the prison environment unsafe in terms of a management perspective. You don't have as many people maintaining the place. There could be riots. Um, so that might very well happen in the next couple of weeks. And so why would you, like, she she, she kept advancing this narrative that, oh, he's at risk of absconding, but it's like, where the fuck is he going to go when the train systems are shut down? There's no flights. Uh, well, the trains aren't shut down, but they're very reduced service. Surveillance everywhere. Like, where the fuck is he going to go <laughs> with health conditions during a global pandemic? Like, he would basically risk killing himself to go anywhere besides the house that he's confined to. So... What the fuck is going on here? Um, well, I can say what the fuck is going on. They, the government, I'm very convinced of this, has probably considered that if he were to catch coronavirus in prison, well, that's sad for him, but he's now, you know, they have no problem with him anymore. He's gone. So this is basically a death sentence. From a judge. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, yeah, this is where we're in a weird spot where right now there's all this different jurisdictional things are happening, like, as far as, like, jurisdictional enforcement of different things. I mean, I've seen, like I said, the last episode, Montana was talking about releasing prisoners, but here in Colorado, they are not talking about that. Like, their the prison system is very much still alive here. And, like, uh, you know, I think this is where it's, like, there's, yeah, there's going to be these different regions and different areas that have these different things. But for sure, it's like 
a guy like Julian that they've been wanting for a long time. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they look at this and they say, like, this is actually the thing we've been waiting for. And, like, you know, I know there's people out there that are like, oh, you know, <laughs> these forces, they're, like, doing this for all these different motives and stuff. It's just, like, it's a big, bad situation, and, like, these people are going to use it to their advantage the best way they can. And some of these things like this are just, like, it's just sick. Really, really sick. I also want to add that there was a statement from Doctors for Assange, which is basically a group of doctors who, you know, some of them have actually assessed him, others, they just want to be supportive. And they've been publishing statements saying that he should be released from prison, that his treatment in prison has been unjust and constitutes torture. And so when his bail uh, was denied, they published a statement saying that they strongly condemn uh, Wednesday's decision by UK District Judge uh, Vanessa Barrett, I don't know how to pronounce her name, Judge, uh, the UK District Judge, to deny bail to Julian Assange despite our prior unequivocal statement that Mr. Assange is at increased risk of serious illness and death were he to con uh, contract coronavirus and the evidence of medical experts uh, was dismissed as well. Um the judge literally said, I have no reason to not trust this advice, as in the UK guidelines, I guess. Um, trust this advice is both evidence-based and reliable uh, and appropriate. Notably, however, she did not address the increased risk to Mr. Assange relative to the general UK prison population, let alone prisoners at HMP Balmarsh, where... Assange is incarcerated, nor did she address the rapidly emerging medical and legal consensus that vulnerable and low-risk prisoners should be released immediately. Uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully, like we are saying, hopefully something will happen to where, he, like, the cards are going to play out in his favor on this. But it is, it doesn't. It looks bleak. All right, you want to talk about some breaking news? Something that broke, like, uh, during the show that uh, stopped posted here. And uh, it looks like this whole, you know, regional jurisdictional breakdown and everything's about to get a lot more official. Donald Trump tweeted out during the show just now, like or about an hour ago, quote, on the recommendation of the White House Corona Task Force and upon consultation with the governors of New York, New Jersey and Connecticut, I have asked the CDC Gov to issue a strong travel advisory to be administered by the governors in consultation with the federal government. A quarantine will not be necessary. Full details will be released by CDC tonight. Thank you. Exclamation point. So it looks like we're about to get some more details on the idea of like what exactly. I mean, he says here a quarantine will not be necessary. But I mean, you're wrapping up the states of New York, New Jersey and Connecticut. And I've been looking at that on a map here. And it's like, you know, I mean, if you're trying to contain the spread of like what is a terrible outbreak in New York. I mean, like, that might be the beginning stages to it, but I mean, like, geez, if you didn't, you'd probably, I mean, they probably, whatever, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. This is where it's like, what exactly does that mean? I don't know. We need to get more details uh, when this press conference comes out, but it's hard to do a show these days. It's like everything, they all, every day there's more and more news breaking and the situation changes on a, yeah, definitely on a daily basis and on an hourly basis like this, where, uh, you know, now we're going to start thinking about how I guess this will be like a regional uh, jurisdiction over there to try and contain this situation and this outbreak in uh, in New York City that appears to be so bad that they're just going to lock down that whole region. So that's the, that's the breaking bit that we were talking about. Well, let's see. I mean, any kind of actual quarantine ain't happening overnight because everybody would lose their shit. Well, this is where it's like for a few will, but now we've been seeing the National Guard move all over the country. And I mean, like what they were saying yesterday in a press conference, like yesterday's press conference almost looked like something out of a movie where they bring up like the weird guy that from the back of the room that's only 20 years old that has like the bright idea or something. It's like, wow, this guy's talking to us, but he is. And uh, they were talking about like the National Guard's going to be moving supplies from you know, supply centers to surge, surge uh, hospitals that they're going to be treating uh, these patients. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure that they will. And, like, it's going to be necessary to try and, like, make sure that those supply chains are always running and that, you know, it's being run by people that are, you know, not putting themselves at risk and understand protocols to do all that. But 
you know, you got all these guys active around there, you know, it wouldn't take much to just say like, hey, you know, we need to, we need to put a weapon in every one of these guys' hands and tell them like, you know, um, hey, like this, uh, this mob has to be quelled or like you have to, like, you know, when you're in the National Guard and you're in these situations, like there is like a, a mission, but missions change, especially in fluid situations like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess, I don't know, Janine, you got anything to toss in on this or you want to go into final thoughts? Uh, we can go into final thoughts. All right, who's up? I'll go ahead and go up just because I'm still kind of in the mode of talking here. But uh, Stop also posted this video yesterday. I posted it in the chat here. It's uh, let me make, let me go read this out so people that aren't they're just listening. It's uh, Grant Sanderson on Twitter or at three blue one brown uh, is his Twitter handle. That's the number three and the number one blue brown. And uh, the video is simulating an epidemic, and it was published just yesterday. And uh, it's a really good, like, you know, 23-minute uh, video on simulating different uh, social distancing and, dim and, stimu and s simulating different, like, R-nons and different, uh, and different scenarios to try and play out, like, how exactly can we nip this in the butt the best way possible? Like, what's the effects of the social distancing? Because I know there's a lot of, like, everybody just... You know, like, hey, well, I'm not going to do this or I am going to do this. And we don't really know the effects of it where this video is a pretty good, uh, you know, filler. It just kind of lets you know, like, this is kind of what happens if we take these different measures. And uh, you'll be uh, pretty well informed, I think, on uh, what these measures and like how, how uh, effective they are if you watch this video. So uh, hopefully you'll see that in the show notes, too. If not, uh, yeah, just uh, check it out on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I guess, Jeannie, you got anything? Whoops, sorry. Yes, I do. Um, so I couldn't, I was going to recite that speech in V for Vendetta, um, but if you do want to find that, I think Giacomo tweeted it out like a week or two ago. But instead, I will uh, give a similar quote that I remember from F.A. Hayek, who said that emergencies have always been the pretext on which the safeguards of individual liberty have been eroded. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I don't really have any uh any thoughts except just uh be safe and smart. All right. Well, yeah, I guess that about does this for this week. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh we'll catch you later, punks. Adios. Later, everyone. Wear masks. <laughs> Yeah, you have to answer yet. Yeah, it's in it. Yeah, it's in it. It's in it. It's in it. It's in it.